before we get to wisdom, we have to talk about the happiness more. So happiness in the proper form comes from meditation, which is purifying the mind. That's the most important thing, to purify the mind. So meditation is not concentration. That's very important to understand. Because uh, the translators have been using that word concentration to refer to samadhi, the word samadhi. That is incorrect. Samadhi is not concentration, but tranquility of mind. It is this tranquility of mind which is not disturbed. This is why the Buddha pointed out that uh, the mind in its natural state is tranquil. It's like water. Water, if you put water in a bottle like that and just keep it, it is tranquil. Even if you put it in a glass, it will be tranquil. Only when the water is disturbed and uh, maybe polluted due to dust or something falling into the water, that you can't see through the water. So there will be color in the water. And, uh, but water in its uh, natural state, now I won't say natural because that's also not very correct, because in the natural state, water can never be pure. What is always polluted. You can never find uh, pure water in the natural state. Because so many other things come and even rain water is polluted in the sense that uh, other things in the air get dissolved in that water so that you can't really find natural water. In the same way, although the human mind is pure in its natural state, but you can never find the pure mind in the normal state. So we'll have to use the word normal and natural as two different things. And uh, so this is why the natural state is a supernormal state. And that supernormal, that idea of supernormal is expressed in the word Arya. Now it is the word Arya that is being translated as noble, noble eightfold path, the four noble truths, that word noble there is really supernormal. The meaning of that. Because the Buddha was really trying to produce supernormal human beings. So when the human being becomes supernormal, he is not human anymore. He's gone beyond the normal, the normal human state. Because the human being, even in other religions they are saying this, but in a different way. Because uh, the no normal human being is a mixture of 
the human and the animal. So when we say animal, we are really talking about uh, the emotions and uh, the human being is also having emotions but in addition to the emotions the human being has this thing called intelligence or ability to think rationally that is what is special about the human being but that animal part is also there because the human being has the emotions and it is these emotions that create all the crime, the wars, the terrorism and all the evils in the world comes from the emotion. Now it was uh, Sigmund Freud in the West who uh, began to realize that the emotions are giving trouble. So his uh, uh, system of psychology and psychotherapy was an effort to help people gain control over the emotions because he saw that the emotions are always coming and creating problems. So he divided the mind into three parts. This is very important to understand. He divided the mind into three parts, id, ego and superego what he called the id, which means id id. Id id is a Latin form of the English it it. The English it it is used to refer to inanimate things. Even a machine or even computer is an it. It is not a he or a she. But when you refer to a human being, you don't say it. You say he or she. And that is the ego. And uh, that human beings he and she refers to that special thing that the human beings have, which is this ability to think. And this idea was borrowed from Descartes, who was a philosopher before Sigmund Freud. So it was Descartes who said, uh, I think therefore I am. What did he say? Cogito ogo sum. What? Cogito ogo sum. Ego? It's, it's in Latin, Bhante. Uh, what? It's, what she's saying is the Latin version of what Descartes said. Uh, I think therefore, therefore I am. I am. Yeah, what was that Latin form? Cogito ogo sum. What is the first word you said? Cogito. I think. Sutito? Cogito. 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 Ergo. Therefore. Yeah. So. That is, I think, therefore I am. But in Western philosophy, from the time of Descartes, 
that idea of ego never disappeared and it came up to even the the later or the modern uh, existential philosophy they kept this idea of ego the self they could never get rid of the idea of self and even today the psychologists because they were following freud and the even the later freudians uh the modern psychologists who have come to meditate buddhist meditation they have come across this problem because modern psychology is now talking about maintaining and preserving the ego they talk about uh, uh self esteem and this self esteem is necessary for mental health they say and uh, to cultivate self esteem they practice these exercises called uh self assertiveness to assert yourself to get self esteem because some people who feel uh, the self confidence is not there so they think they must uh, practice self assertiveness to get self esteem but when they go to do meditation the buddhist meditation the modis meditation teachers say you have to give up yourself <laughs> so this has become a problem for them huh hmm? and this is why it is very interesting to see that the buddha spoke about this same three things the id ego and the super ego in talking about personalizing now uh, even in freud freudian psychology they speak about the personality and they talk about uh, the personality being divided into these three parts the id ego and the super ego uh this is called the structural hypothesis structural hypothesis that means dividing the mind or the personality into three structures structural hypothesis a hypothesis is simply a theory in order to explain what is going on so these three things that the buddha the, not the buddha freud spoke of in the structural way was actually functional parts they were not structures they were functions you know what that means function is an activity whereas a structure is an entity so we have to distinguish between an activity and an entity now this is 
an entity. Huh? But if I shake this, that is an activity. So you know the difference between an entity and an activity. So what we call this mind are really mental processes. A process is an activity. So we, we cannot be talking about an entity called mind. It is an activity. Even in the history of psychology, they call it structuralism and uh, uh, functionalism. They had these two ways of thinking talking about the mind as a structure and talking about the mind as a function. Function is an activity and structure is an entity. Now today even the Buddhists talk about two things called mind and body. And they use these two terms used by the Buddha, Nama and Rupa. They say Nama means mind and Rupa means body, which is not correct. That is not what the Buddha said. But all the Buddhists uh, uh, who are supposed to be studying Buddhism, they talk about this. Even the meditators are talking about this. And even in this uh, uh, so-called insight meditation, they talk about this and in the meditation they say you walk, do walking meditation so you observe how the legs move, raising the leg, stretching the leg forward and bringing the leg down. Then raise the other leg, stretch it forward and bring it down. Then you raise the right leg, stretch it forward, bring it down. Then you lift the, lift the left leg, stretch it forward, bring it down. Now, you do that as a meditation. And after doing that for a long time, the teacher says, now you have understood the body which is called Rupa. And then they are asked to observe not only that movement of the leg, but before you begin to move the leg, you have this desire to raise the leg. Then the desire to stretch it forward then the desire to put it down, then the desire to raise the other leg, the desire to stretch it forward and reside. Now when you begin to observe the desire, they say that is Nama, and that is now you are observing the mind. Nama is the mind. So becoming aware of the body, and becoming aware of the mind. And they say, now you have got insight because you are now aware of the body. Now that kind of meditation and that kind of uh, way of thinking itself is the wrong way of thinking according to the Buddha. You see, this is why today all meditations are all taught in the wrong way. And uh, so now I don't want to get into the criticizing other people's methods, but the important thing is that meditation, as the Buddha taught, is learning 
to calm the mind and to relax the body. Relaxing the body and calming the mind because that is the natural state of the body is a relaxed state of the body. And the natural state of the mind is an undisturbed, calm state of the mind. This is getting back to the normal, natural state, which is the original state. Because we as human beings, we have these senses, five senses. And we become aware of the world because of the five senses. Otherwise we don't know that there is a thing called the world. So the, we become aware of the world through the five senses. But we not only become aware of the world, we also react to the world emotionally. And that reaction begins to form what are called relationships. What is a relationship? That reaction is turned into a habit. So a habit of reacting. You see, uh, say, a nice uh, person of the opposite sex and then a reaction and that reaction is maintained and that maintaining the reaction is what you call falling in love. You see, you are maintaining that reaction. It becomes a habit and you continue that same reaction. And it becomes a permanent thing. You begin to see it as permanent. My girlfriend or my boyfriend or whatever you call it, <laughs> is the same thing, it becomes a permanent thing. And you begin to think of the world as permanent. But there is nothing permanent in the world. Everything is changing every moment. When you open your eyes, your eyes like a camera and your camera is taking pictures. <laughs> but it is like a camera that is a movie camera which is taking <coughs> pictures all the time. So it's not an ordinary camera, it's a movie camera. And so many pictures are being taken, not just one picture. And uh, that is held as a memory. So whenever you think of the past, what are you thinking about? What you call the past is this collection of memories. If you didn't have the memory, there would be no past. And when you think of the future, what are you talking about? All imagination, future <laughs> is imagination something that never happened. You think it's going to happen. So in the future is also just made up by your imagination. And the present, you don't know what you are talking about. <laughs> what, you call the, what you call the present? Is it the present year that you are talking about or is it the present month that you are talking about or is it the present uh, week that you are talking about or is it the present day that you are talking about even the present day is a collection of memories and imaginations what else are you talking about or oh, is it the present hour that you are talking about as present? 
or are you referring to the present uh, minute or are you referring to the present second because every fraction of a second the present is becoming the past <laughs> so where is the present so the, the past present and future are just made up things there is no reality the only reality is change there is only change that is going on but this changing things we are putting all that together and then calling it something permanent so we think of time as something permanent and we think of the future we are thinking of uh, eternity what is eternity all imaginary things so we are living in a world of imagination we are not living in the real world there is no real world at all hmm and then we also imagine that i exist what is that i that you are talking about when we experience seeing is an experience hearing is an experience and that experience is just being going on every moment it is a new experience and this experience is divided into two this experience we divide into two as the objective experience and the subjective experience the objective and the subjective the objective experience we refer to as something outside and the subjective experience we personalize and say this is mine when a desire arises there is the desire and what you desire what you desire is an objective experience and the desire is a subjective experience and the subjective experience you say is mine i desire this desire is mine but what i desire is something outside and when you say this is mine there must be i to say this is mine so uh, i is automatically coming up but you don't know where that i is so the i becomes simply everything that you have personalized becomes the i which is the subjective experience is the totality of the subjective experience and that totality is what the buddha called panchakhanda 
द फाइव फाइव काइंड्स ऑफ टोटैलिटी और द फाइव वट नो दैट वर्ड एग्रीगेट आई डोंट यूज बिकॉज दैट इज ऑल्सो मिसलीडिंग it is an aggregate in the sense that it's a collection it's a collection of experiences that you put together and imagine an entity there is no entity here there is only an activity and that activity comes in the form of images because it is a movie camera that is taking pictures and uh, not one picture many pictures so you take put all those things together it's a collection of pictures and that you personalize and say this is mine that is the subjective experience that you personalize the personalized collection uh there are different uh, parts of the collection or oh, five constituents five constituents of the you want to use the word aggregate you can use it. it's the totality or oh, the four for constituents of the aggregate of uh, experience the subjective experience which is personalized that is what becomes yourself so otherwise there is no self to talk about there is no time and there is no space either when we talk about space if we were like trees and if we never walked if we couldn't walk and if we were just stationary like trees and if he didn't have two eyes if he had only one eye we won't see space we are thinking of space only because we are moving and if nothing was moving there would be no time or space it is this movement and change and the change is what produces both time and space oh there is also moving <laughs> you see this whole image that we have formed is what we call the world and uh, not only the world we have also built a self and the self is the subjective part and the world is the objective part so we think we are in the world what is it that we call in as if there is some space inside and we are living in that space all this is 
a creation of the mind or the mental process that is going on. If we didn't have this thing called thinking, there would be no world or a self. Thinking is what is going on and producing all these things. You see, what we call meditation is actually to stop this process which is called thinking and also emotional reaction. There is the thinking and thinking part and the emotional part, two parts, which modern psychologists call the cognitive and the affective. The cognitive is the thinking part and the affective is the emotional part. So the Buddha stopped this whole process. First, stop the emotional part. So the mind was tranquil. To bring about tranquility of mind, normal, when we speak of the tranquility of the mind, We are only stopping the emotional disturbance. When the emotional disturbance is stopped, we call it tranquility. So when we talk about the jhana, I translate that word jhana as ecstasy. What is the meaning of the word ecstasy? Stasi means standing, to stand, stasi is to stand. Ek means outside to stand outside. Now if you get out of this door and stand outside, that is ecstasy. <laughs> Standing outside. But we are living in a world which is produced by the cognitive process and the affective process. The affective process is the emotional part. The cognitive process is the creation of entities out of activities. It is the mind that is active, creating entities. So when I see you as a individual, I am seeing an entity that is a product of cognition. So it is that cognitive process that is producing an entity called you, which I call you, but you call I, but is entity. <laughs> but the thing is that uh, then having seen you, maybe I react emotionally. Either I like you or I hate you. These are both emotions. So that <laughs> That emotional part 
is the effective. So normally, we are not only producing entities, we are also having emotional relationships. And that relationship is also a permanent thing. We see it as something permanent. Relationship. So that we get out of that emotional world. Getting out of the emotional world is the ecstasy. Standing out of the emotional world is the ecstasy standing out of that emotional world is the ecstasy so there is the first ecstasy the second ecstasy the third ecstasy and the fourth ecstasy how do I stand out of this emotional world? The first ecstasy is to be free of what are called the hindrances, five hindrances. The, the desire for sensual pleasures, the hatred or anger, the the sleepiness or laziness, the worries and anxieties and really indecision which where the mind begins to split into two and go in two different directions. That is what is called cognitive dissonance. That means we have two, two ideas in the mind which are in conflict. Am I to practice the five precepts or to act emotionally. Uh, the first precept says, don't hurt other people, don't harm other people. But I become angry and I want to harm, hurt the other person. <laughs> so, my mind is divided into two. Am I going to practice the first precept? Or am I going to kill that person or <laughs> hurt that person, take revenge? Or there is something that I can pick up? Am I going to practice the second precept or take it away, which doesn't belong to me but belongs to other people? I can take it either by force, by holding a gun or threatening the person, or I can just steal it without the other person knowing it. So one is called stealing, the other is called robbery. So whether you rob or steal, you are taking other people's properties. Now there again, the emotion pulling in one direction and your reason or thinking pulling in the other direction. That is the vichikicca. Today translated as doubt. It's not doubt. It is the mind split into two. That is the cognitive dissonance. Your mind is pulling in two different directions.
So all the five precepts are really not only the five precepts, even the eight precepts or ten precepts, whatever the precept, you want to do one thing and the precept says no. Huh? So the mind split into two. That is really the emotions go about one thing and the thinking, reasoning was wants another thing. So this problem is this difficulty for the thinking part to control the emotional part. That difficulty is the vichikicca. <coughs> it's not doubt. Hmm. Doubt is about whether it is true or false. This is not about true or false. This is about shall I or shall I not. Hmm? These are two different things. <laughs> so this is why this word Chetana, Chetana is really the decision the decision you make at this moment. Are you deciding to be carried away by the emotion or are you deciding to be carried away by the thinking part or reason? So reason and emotion in conflict. So are you going to be acting according to reason or according to emotion. So if you want to succeed in life, you have to be carried away by your reason and not your emotion. Now when you are uh, children going to school, in the morning you don't like to wake up and get ready to go to school. You like to sleep more and stay at home. But as you grow up, when you begin to do a job, the same problem comes up. With it, <laughs> wake up and get ready to go for the job, or whether to stay at home and send an excuse saying that you are sick and you stay at home. So you see, all that is emotion and reason. That is the vichikicca. You see, one very important thing the Buddha discovered that our actions are guided by the image in the mind. So, now when you are sleeping and you have to go to do the jobs. So if your 
mind is imagining the job that you are doing. Then you are thinking, oh, I have to do this, I have to do that. Then you get up and get ready to go. But if your uh, mind is, oh, I'm sleeping, I saw a nice <coughs> dream, I have to see this dream further, <laughs> I have to, uh, I feel very uh, cold or uh, the, I want to, don't like to get out of the blanket, I want to be inside. Uh, all that is your image in the mind. So, are you going to focus on that image or are you going to focus on the other image? So, if you see it in terms of images in the mind, you change the image. So, this way, it is the image that is important. And that is what is called Samma Sankhapa. The word Sankhapa is being used. Uh, that is why in the Noble Eight, uh, there you get Samma Ditti is your understanding, how you understand the problem. And having understood the problem, then you have to put your mind on the image that is the goal you are seeking. That is why I call it the goal orientation. You, you think of the goal. That is why now Ananda should be Thinking of the goal, I want to become a doctor. And if you think of the goal, then you'll have to go and study. If you don't think of the goal, then you like to maybe sit and play a game or some sort of thing like that or maybe some other thing. So the important thing is the, the goal, goal orientation. There was a student who was studying to get a PhD. So what he did was on his door, he wrote PhD, so that every time he comes out of the door, he sees PhD. Every time he comes into the door, also he sees PhD. On both sides, he has PhD. So his mind is always on the PhD. So he was studying. Ultimately, he got the PhD because he... So, this is why you should always put your goal as a picture on the wall or maybe on the door or in your room. So, the more you put those pictures, now some people, these mainly the teenagers, they have a lot of pictures on the wall, in the room, you see. If, if you put the wrong kind of picture, that will be your life. So you should always put the right kind of pictures. That is why we have all these pictures, life of the Buddha, and the statues of the Buddha. So when you come here, you'll see only those pictures, and that means you are thinking of the Buddha and 
what you have to do. You also have to become like the Buddha. So the pictures help people to find their way. Because the images you have in your mind is very important. That is why in the meditation you have to form pictures in your mind all the time. If you, if you form good pictures in the mind, your mind can get purified through that. So it is, some people call it visualization or visual meditation. So if you want to stand out, ecstasy, you have to have in your mind standing out, not standing inside. So if you cultivate the right images in your mind, you will be able to stand out. Get out of these hindrances. The hindrances, they are called hindrances because they hinder you. They don't let you get out. They will keep you inside. In the emotional world, the world of emotions, which is an unhappy world. When your mind is filled with emotions, you are unhappy. It's only when the mind is free of emotions, you'll be happy. So happiness is not another emotion. It is the absence of emotions. So real happiness is a calm, tranquil state of the mind, free of emotions. So the real ecstasy is when the mind has been purified, free of emotions. So what is called the first ecstasy, there are five factors in the first ecstasy. So, uh, another factor? Huh? What? Take a bit, one-pointedness. No, no, no. Ekagata is not one-pointedness. That is wrong translation. Vitakka vichara. Huh? Vitakka vichara piti. Vitakka vichara piti sukha ekagata. You have to understand vitakka and vichara. Vichara means questioning. Vichara means questioning. What is this? This is a bag. What is this? This is... I don't know what you call this. <laughs> Something that you hang on your ears. What is this? This is a book. So you have always a question and an answer. The question is vichara. And answer is vitakka. Vitakka vichara. So those five things you get in the first jhana. That means the first ecstasy. You have those five things. Vitakka vichara, those two go together. Vitakka vichara means questioning and answering. 
Now, if you are doing uh, breathing meditation, you ask the question, what is this? This is breathing in. What is this? This is breathing out. So any meditation, you're always asking a question and answering. You see, that means there are bad vitakka vicharas and good vitakka vicharas. Now in the hindrances, like Kama Chand, what is this? a beautiful girl. That is the <laughs> question and answer. The moment you do that, what happens? Passion, lust arises. That is a bad vitakka vichara. Good vitakka vichara is you are thinking only breathing in, and breathing out. <laughs> this is breathing in, this is breathing out. There you don't get the lust and the passion. You are relaxing the breathing in, relaxing the breathing out. As you relax, the whole body begins to relax. And all those agitations disappear. So, the vitakka vichar, only the good vitakka vichar is there. That means, what is this vitakka vichar? Questioning uh, and answering. That is forming a concept. Forming a concept. Forming a concept. Vitakka vichara is what is called conceptual thinking, which is forming a concept. So whenever you form a concept, there is always a question and an answer. But here we are forming good questions, not <laughs> forming good concepts, not bad concepts. Bad concepts are emotional concepts. I hate you is an emotional concept. Oh, I love you is also an emotional concept. You see? That also emotional concept. So, but here we are not talking about those emotional concepts. When you get out of that emotional world, ecstasy is to form only calming, relaxing concepts. And when that happens, your mind becomes free of emotions. When your mind is free of emotions, you become happy. And that happiness is the preeti. Preeti means happiness. You begin to feel happy. And not only your mind is happy, your body relaxes. When the body relaxes, you begin to feel very comfortable. That comfort is sukha. Sukha means that comfort. Sukha is the comfort. And when you experience that happiness and comfort, 
your mind is tranquil undisturbed the mind is without disturbance it is not now not going in two different directions the emotions pulling in one direction and the thinking pulling in another direction that division into two is not there anymore it has stopped it has become unified that unification of the mind is ekagata ek means one ek agga agga means end one end there are no two ends there is only one end that is the meaning of ekagata is not now some people go one pointed that is also correct in a way because the, you are pointing only in one direction the mind is pointing only in one direction it is the undisturbed mind the mind that is unified and it is tranquil now you understood what the ecstasy is now you are really standing out of the emotional world but you are still in the cognitive world you are now in the cognitive world and not in the emotional world but till the mind is active because you are doing the cognitive part is there now the emotional part is not there but still you are having the cognitive part going on now the next step is to get into the second level second ecstasy you are going to you are coming out further that is where you stop forming concepts you don't ask what is that and you don't answer this is a book you don't question you don't answer and so your mind is not disturbed because you are not questioning you are not answering so you are not forming concepts but your mind is happy and your body is relaxed and therefore you are feeling comfortable and the mind is still because the mind is not going in two different directions mind is unified and still that is the second ecstasy when you come to the third ecstasy that happiness is seen as a disturbance even the happiness is seen as a disturbance and you stop that disturbance hmm. so there is more peace in that state here your yes. mind is more peaceful there and then that is the third ecstasy 
And when you get into the fourth ecstasy, even the comfort disappears. That doesn't mean that you become uncomfortable. Because there are three kinds of sensations. Pleasant, unpleasant and the neutral. You are getting into the neutral state, not the uncomfortable state. Your comfort also disappeared. And comfort and discomfort both disappeared. And you are in a neutral state. And the mind is tranquil state of the mind. That is perfect tranquility of mind. That is the fourth ecstasy. You have become completely tranquil. And in that tranquil state, your mind is not focused on anything outside. Now your mind is focused on what? The inside. And it is at that stage that you can become aware of the subjective experience, not the objective experience. And the subjective experience, which has been personalized, is now not being personalized. You are able to become aware of the subjective experience as an impersonal process. An impersonal process that is going on. And there is no personality there. An impersonal process that is going on. But still, what is going on is what is called the cognitive process. And it is that cognitive process that is going on. And you are aware of that cognitive process that is going on. And the cognitive process is simply Passa, Vedana, maybe really the Vedana and the Sanya. Vedana, Sanya, Sankar, Vijnana. The Vedana is the feeling. of pleasure or pain or the neutral feeling. Now in this, at this stage, in the fourth ecstasy, you don't have the pleasure or the pain, so you are only aware of the neutral sensation. The neutral sensation. And then you have the perception That means you can, you are aware of this seeing or the awareness of something. 
and then that is the sanya sanya is the awareness of something and the awareness or the sensation it is really the sensation so the sensation and the feeling of the sensation so when we speak of a sensation and there are two aspects of this the feeling whether it is pleasant or unpleasant or neutral and the sensation now it's difficult for you to uh, distinguish between these two things now if you look at this picture here what you see is not an object what you see is the color because in this eye there is a thing called a retina and there are nerve endings there and light comes in the form of waves having a wavelength or frequency and these nerve endings there are different nerve endings one nerve ending can uh, uh, become aware of one frequency that means you can see only one color so different nerve endings see in different colors violet indigo blue green yellow orange red so what you really see when you open your eyes is only color but the color can be pleasant or unpleasant or neutral so vedana refers to whether it is pleasant unpleasant or neutral and sanya refers to the color it is the blue or red or white or what is the color that is the sanya and then out of the color you create a figure and if you say ah uh, the buddha that means you have created a figure out of the color that is the sankara sankara means construction it's a mental construct that's the meaning of sankara vedana sanya sankara but you are creating not only one object you are creating several objects and to distinguish between one object and another object that is vijnan so vijnan is the process of perception that is called perception vijnana is not consciousness just perception vijnana is perception now what you perceive through the different senses it is it is carried to the brain through different nerves optic nerve auditory nerve olfactory nerve and like that 
different nerves carry from the different senses to the brain and the brain begins to think and reason out. That process is what is called cognition or recognition, recognition. You give meaning to what you saw or heard or smelled or tasted or touched. Now that process, you are now looking at the process of perception that is going on in the mind, what is inside. You are now focusing on what is going on inside. You are not looking at an object. You are looking at the looking. You are looking at the process of perception. That is, you are looking at what is normally called the five aggregates. What are called the five aggregates is really the process of perception, which is the subjective process that you personalize and call yourself. So you are personalizing the subjective process. And by personalizing that subjective process, you call it yourself. So, in that fourth ecstasy, you can become aware of that subjective process. Now, when you go beyond that, now you begin to stop that process of perception also gradually. That is the cognitive process. You enter the sphere or the you can call it the sphere also. What is called the the sphere of infinite space. Space means what is empty. Yes. We don't see any objects there. You are only seeing empty space. You are looking at empty space. No more seeing objects. Because that process of seeing objects has stopped. You are not aware of objects. You are only aware of empty space. That is, you are gradually stopping the cognitive process. You are not aware of objects anymore. You don't form objects. You don't ask the question, what is this? You don't answer the question, this is this. You're not forming any objects now. You're only aware of empty space. And then you begin to stop that also. 
you are taking your attention away, away from empty space and you are looking at the process of perception that is vijnana chaitana perception is vijnana you are aware of the process of perception And then you stop that also. You stop focusing on the process of perception. Then what are you aware of? You are aware of nothing. It's called akinchanyatana. Akincha means there is nothing. But there you are focusing on nothing and nothing becomes your object. When you begin to focus on nothing, nothing becomes the object. Then you stop even focusing on nothing. You are taking your attention away from nothing. Then you come to Nema Sanya Na Sanya Atana. You come to the point where there is neither sensation no, no sensation. You are not focusing on a sensation. You are not aware of no sensation. This is what is called the threshold of awareness. Then from there you go to the cessation of sensation and feeling. Sanya Vedaita Nirod. The cessation of sensation and feeling. That is the stopping of that activity called cognition. That activity called cognition is stopped. First you stop the effective part of the activity. Now you stop the cognitive part of the activity. That is stopping that thing called mind altogether. Because mind is not an entity, it is an activity. And that activity is stopped. Hmm. That is what the Buddha achieved. He stopped the activity. Is that the end of what he did? He didn't end it there. Then he came out of it again. And only when he came out of it, what did he see? That this whole world is created 
by this mental process. Not only the world, even yourself is created by this mental process. That is seeing what is called the Paticca Samoppa. So that becoming aware of the mental process is to become aware of experience. That mental process is what is called the experience. So he saw experience, but the experience is creating existence. So the existence is created by this mental process called experience. And the existence is not a reality. He saw there is only an experience. And the experience is an activity that is going on. It's the activity that we call the mind. But there is no such thing as mind. Mind is an entity created by this activity called experience. And that means even yourself that you are thinking of is a creation of this mental process. And there is no real self here. And if there is no real self, Can you speak of death? If there is no self, there is no one to die. All that we can see is the impermanence of this activity. This activity is going on. There is no person here. And that is the end of all suffering, all unhappiness. It was these existential philosophers who thought the most basic truth is existence. But here the Buddha saw that existence itself is a delusion or an illusion. It is because we assume that there is, we are existing we also think that we are going to die. But if there is no existence, how can there be death? That is the freedom from death. This is why the Buddha set out to preach the Dhamma. Open is the door to immortality, deathlessness. 
Open is the door to deathlessness. Those who have ears can hear and be free. Only a very few heard the drum of deathlessness. The Buddha beat the drum of deathlessness. Very few heard it. <laughs> That's how it was. <laughs> 